Welcome everyone to our uh, little, what's this, the fourth installment of FreeBSD Office Hours. Uh, and this week we're going to uh, let the audience ask their questions to some of the candidates for the FreeBSD core team. The election is ongoing now. Uh, anyone who's a FreeBSD committer who's committed in the last 12 months uh, can vote. And that's how we change the leadership of FreeBSD every two years. Uh, to make sure it represents uh, the people in the project. Not everybody wants. Yeah. Uh, so actually, maybe if we want to do introductions first, uh, I guess alphabetically, because it's easiest. Uh, so that's Ed first. Oh, wow. So I'm Ed Mast. Uh, I have been a FreeBSD user and developer for a decade and a half or so. Um, I've served a couple of terms on the core team, um, not on the current core team, but uh, the one before and the one before that. Uh, I was a, a core team member, and I'm currently managing projects, uh, project development for the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, so next will be George. Oh, alphabetical by first name. I was super confused. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm George Noble Neal. I've worked on and around uh, FreeBSD and BSD systems for most of my career, which is now getting up to be 35 years. Um, I have been on FreeBSD's core team before, but not the previous core team, <clears throat> because even though we don't have a bylaw that says it, um, I tend to uh, term limit myself, um, so I'll do only ter two terms on and then some number of terms off. Uh, I also currently help out on SEC team. Uh, next, we'll do John Mark. Hello, uh, I'm John Mark, also known as JMG. I've been uh, involved with FreeBSD since almost near the beginning and a committer almost as long as that. Um, I've been recently, work, I have, this is the first time running for core. So, uh, so that means I've never been on core before. And also um, I've been recently in, interested in, um, lo long time interested in supporting ARM and then also now more supporting automation and testing and also continuing to improve our documentation. Uh, Bartek, are you? There, uh, you can introduce yourself. Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. My name is Bartek Lutkowski, aka uh, Robak. Um, I'm a Forge committer um, since roughly 2014. Um, closer or further from the project um, since roughly uh, 2000. I was very uh, lucky to fall um, in my youth under wings of people who directed me uh, towards um, BSD in general and not in some weird uh, Linux direction. Um, it's the first time I'm running um, for the core and I'm mostly interested in um, improving how the project can work, uh, can open to um, new uses, uh, new committees perhaps, and new technologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justin Hibbets. Your turn. Hi. Um, I've been a previous committer for, what, almost nine years now? Eight? Yeah, almost nine years now. Um, my focus has been PowerPC, and <clears throat> my interest in running for core lies mostly in uh, putting more control and more freedom in the hands of the developers and People ask, what's Core going to do about it? And I say, what are we going to do about it? OK. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Bowling, you're next. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Kevin Bowling. My involvement in FreeBSD um, goes back a ways as a user, but uh, I would say 2014 is when I started um, becoming more involved in the community. Um, I have a ports bit for about two years. I did some 
work for cluster admin um, and I've been uh, involved with a variety of projects on the uh, source side as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kurt? Hold on a second. Uh, no, there you here go. we go. Now we can hear. Um, I'm uh, running for card to uh, be able to get a little bit more progress with respect to the infrastructure. I'm a little bit uh, involved in the postmaster and fabric uh, stuff. I'm a ports committer for a few years. I'm using FreeBSD since a very long time, so quarter of a century or something. And um, what I'm interested in is there are certain problems with the mail infrastructure, with the fabric. It's not, it's not working as I hope it should work. And so uh, I'm trying to find a way to get some kinks out of this process to, uh, to, to improve this process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kyle? Uh, I can't hear Kyle. Yes, uh, Kyle, you seem to be unmuted, but I don't have audio at the moment. You're muted now. Kyle and I tested this last night and it worked. <laughs> Uh, we'll come back to Kyle while he tries to figure that out. Uh, Manu, do you want to do next? Yeah. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Emmanuel Vado, uh, Manu at FreeBSD. I'm a FreeBSD user since uh, 2003, 2004, uh, source committer uh, since 2016, and port committer to, since uh, 2018, I think. Uh, it's my first time running for core. Uh, I used to think that we don't need core but uh, a few events in the past show me that we do need core for non-technical uh, problems. Uh, and that's my main motivation for uh, running for core. Uh, I think to, to have dealt with them uh, in the past year uh, proved me that some people need to do non-technical stuff uh, for FreeBSD. Okay. And since he's there, uh, Bat, do you want to go next? Yes, um, I'm Baptiste Daroussin. Uh, I'm a FreeBSD user for almost 20 years now. And I think this year is my 10th anniversary uh, for my port and source commit bit. Um, I'm a member of the port manager team. I've been uh, twice uh, in the core team already. I took a break uh, in, uh, uh, after two, uh, two shifts. Uh, and now I'm fresh again, and I'm able to uh, to run again for core. And I, uh, as Manu, uh, I think that we there is a lot of work to do in the non-technical side of the project, uh, communication with other projects, also making sure that FreeBSD is known in other streams um, and things like that. So I'm running again. Thank you. Uh, so next, Mark. Hi, um, I'm Mark. I've been a FreeBSD user for about 10 years, a source committer for, I think, um, about seven now, since 2013. Um, I've done a lot of work in the kernel in various areas. Uh, this is my first time running for core. I'm, I'm interested largely in, in just trying to get a better handle on uh, the pain points that FreeBSD users have, um, as, as well as FreeBSD developers. So problems that are internal to the project, things like uh, uh, management of infrastructure like mailing lists and fabricator and so on and then uh, external problems from, from especially large FreeBSD users. I think Beyond Core gives one a fair bit of visibility into that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in contributing to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Mohammed. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, people actually call me Moin. So 
I have been a previous user since 2000 maybe, but and I have been submitting a few patches since 2003, but it was in 2014 when I got my course commit bit. Uh, I do sometimes help with the Fabric Admin works. Uh, my main motivation was to join the core was actually uh, like uh, when we are on the Asian side mainly or South Asian side or in the Middle East region, we actually have a bit difficulty with the speed of PKG. So uh, like getting more mirrors or like developing an infrastructure which can help uh, getting a better speed or local mirrors with the PKG staffs. So I'll actually try to uh, work on that side. So that was my motivation behind uh, joining the uh, from behind trying for the core. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rod? Yeah, I'm Rod Grimes. I've been using BSD since the early 80s. Um, I'm a FreeBSD project founder from the 1993. I've been using it ever since. I took a about a 15 year hiatus from the project and went off and did some other things, but continued to watch from afar. Um, I came back a couple of years ago and have become more involved in the project and am looking to see if some time on core might do me some good. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Rene. Uh, Renee, you're still muted. muted. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. All right, we'll come back to Renee. Uh, Scott Long? Yeah, hi. Uh, Scott Long been involved in FreeBSD since uh, the beginning, back in 1992, been a committer since 2000. Uh, was a release engineer for a number of years in the early mid 2000s and was on core briefly during that time too. And uh, looking to get more deeply involved again, uh, like the work that the current core team uh, did in terms of modernizing practices and tools. I want to keep that going. Yeah, thank you. And Sean? Um, been using BSD since the late, late, early two thousand, late nineties, early two thousands. Um, mostly as a, I would say, power user um, in corporate environment. Certainly as a, as an advocate and sponsor, trying to uh, get funding to the project um, through commercial means and through use in industry, um, uh, typically at scale. Um, did the the community survey and um, and looking to continue some of that the work to help modernize our project uh, infrastructure going forward. Okay, and Warner. Yeah, my name is Warner Lash. I've been with the project since '93 or so. When Jordan uh, sent me a hard disk saying, "Here, try this. Port your software to it." Um, I've been on a couple of core teams since then and have done uh, a lot of work in the operating system uh, or just in general, the kernel and user land, I mean. And uh, uh, I'm running to uh, to be my second term in a row uh, and then I'll stop. But I'm running to uh, shepherd the, the, you know, help shepherd the project through the different technology shifts that we have coming up with the transition to Git, the transition of uh, the industry in part to ARM64, and some other challenges that uh, we face. So that's who I am and why I'm running. All right, thank you. Uh, and then whoever joined by phone, I, I'm not actually sure who that is, um, but it's your turn. I'm not sure uh, how you unmute yourself when you join by phone. <laughs> Uh, I guess we'll come back there. Uh, Kyle, did you get your audio working? Nope. That's weird. So to unmute by phone, it's star six, I believe. OK. We can try that. Nope, they're unmuted now. 
All right. Uh, do you hear me, guys? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so that was not so easy to join this call because, you know, so it's uh, different numbers and pin codes and uh, finally, so yeah, I was muted. Well, so in any cases, my name is uh, Sergey Asokin. Um, uh, I'm the FreeBSD user for um, mostly 20 years, I think, and um, I've got my uh, ports commit bid uh, in 2003. Um, so I actually did several improvements for existing uh, ports infrastructure and uh, supporting, still supporting um, uh, several event-driven uh, ports like um, Anginix and um, uh, Redis. Um, yeah, so this is, I've never been in, I've never been in a, a previous core team before uh, this election and um, so I'm thinking that uh, I can be more involved in these projects. Um, and another thing is I'm just, you know, to legitimate the election uh, of the free BSD core team as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is it from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Renee, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, uh, so we'll go to the first question I've got here. Uh, it's actually from Benedict. And he asks, uh, what do you think are the current challenges that the FreeBSD project faces uh, that you being on core can uniquely help with in the next two years? Dallin, are you going to call on people or do we need to raise uh, our hands? Yeah, maybe uh, we don't necessarily have to go through everyone for every question. Uh, but yeah, if somebody wants to go. I can go. Um, okay. One of the things that the project is facing is a transition to having more than one tier one platform potentially as ARM64 um, becomes more mature in the marketplace and in our code base. And that presents a number of challenges because we don't have a good common understanding of what the developer obligations are for being a tier one platform. So one of the things that I can help if I'm elected to core is help in talking to the different groups that we have, the kernel developers, the user line developers, ports people, docs people, to help um, get a shared understanding of what that would be and what any transition of ARM64 to tier one might entail. And there's, there's other things too, but I'll give other people a chance to talk. All right, I'll uh, mention something here. I think for me, uh, one of the big challenges facing FreeBSD is staying relevant for new users. Um, and so, you know, kids in uh, uh, university who are looking to experiment with operating system development or whatnot, uh, make sure that FreeBSD is is exciting and interesting to them as a platform to um, to take that sort of thing on. Uh, I think that uh, I've had some um, uh, some success in the small scale in in bringing new people um, into FreeBSD, and I'm quite happy to see uh, that two of my mentees are uh, on this this core uh, candidate panel um, with me. Um, and I've I've brought in some some folks through um, uh, University of Waterloo co-op placements, um, working for the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, but really, I would like to try and scale that up so that. Uh, FreeBSD is is really an interesting place for for new people to um, to make a mark. I will go next um, since I very much agree with Ed here. I think we as a project kind of slipped into irrelevancy, um, especially for uh, new users, but also for uh, new companies. And I personally think that we may have not lost our capability um, to change and adapt. But the world um, has speed up and moves with the speed of light compared to us, uh, whereas we still um, stick to kind of, um, you know, I, I won't call it outdated, um, but uh, a different world tool set, uh, different world uh, mindset, um, things like Polar Principle, uh, which serves us well for the decades I, I kind of think it stopped serving us very well where we actually did not lost the uh, relevancy for new users we don't necessarily make life easier for them um, things like uh, SVN things like not being um, 
Git friendly, and I hate to say it. Um, it actually does count. They don't know what those things are from their perspective and perspective of their potential employees. Them investing time in learning those uh, arcane tools is just a waste of time. So free BSD is a waste of time for them. And I would very much love to um, change that if possible. Let me jump in for a second. I'm on the tip of that spear, actually. I have a tendency in companies to, uh, um, well, one of the sad things for me is I see companies making the comment, what, what is FreeBSD? And having to explain that you know the, the entire world on computers doesn't mean that you have to use Linux or Windows. Um, in corporate environments in particular, I, I'd like to, uh, the, one, the reason I ran actually the last term was, was um, in order to um, help maintain BSD's relevance in commercial applications, because if there's not commercial relevance, then um, funding dries up and that, that becomes a real problem. And so maintaining that is, for me, very much feels like an existential priority number one type crisis. Um, and that does mean that the project does need to evolve at a faster rate than it was in the past. So I'll yeah. jump in here. Um, so I think uh, the current core has left two things or is about to leave two things that the next core is going to have to deal with and they're fairly large. Uh, that's the transition to Git and the new code of conduct. And I guess I bring up the political third rail of the project in the uh, call. Um, I'm running because generally my role on core is to force things to get finished. Um, and my goal, if I'm elected to core for the next term is to make sure that the Git and the code of conduct thing are finally done and dusted because taking forever to do them just makes them worse. And I happen to agree with both uh, Ed and George. The co code of conduct, I think, is a very important part and is necessary in the modern world to make sure that we are able to accept new people and get influence for everybody. But as also Ed talked about, uh, getting uh, being relevant to new users, making sure new blood, part of that is making sure that we run on a lot of the less expensive platforms so people don't have to be um, have to spend five hundred dollars a thousand dollars to be able to use it. And so ARM64 and other stuff are now becoming much more attractive. Being able to get um, binary packages will um, be a huge improvement. The other thing that I also think is important that we need to spend more time on is making sure that we have testing in place so that there are not regressions and the stability that companies need today that it, it, they did not need the same stability back in 1995 and 93 when FreeBSD started, even though we were extremely stable then, but we really need to make sure that uh, we People have, we've seen with uh, Yahoo and other companies being able to stay on current is very important. And in order to stay on current, testing is very important to make sure there's not regressions. So those are the, those are the things. Yeah, one thing about the code of conduct, we, um, as the current core team, will be publishing something next week and hope to have it done by the end of the term. So one less thing for you to do, George, although I'm sure you'll have plenty. Yeah. Similarly, the Git working group, I think, you know, Ed can maybe talk to this, is, is due to come out. Um, I think there, there's some updates and, and um, initial big steps there in late June, early July. Um, that's the current timeline that that's tracking, too. So. Does anyone else want to answer this question before I ask the next one? Okay. Uh, so the next one was, let's scroll off my screen now. Um, Broader adoption tends to bring more developers. What target areas do you think we should focus on to be able to gain more market share and therefore more developers? At the moment, cloud environments is really important. And right now it's very difficult to get a usable BSD based cloud application running um, using modern tooling. Um, if you can't use the tools that companies have adopted, then you don't even make it out of the starting gate. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I've been working with Vagrant, and right now we don't actually, um, I mean, we kind of work out of Vagrant, but it's very clear people are not testing that regularly, and so getting that improved is also important. I will jump on that, um, but with a slightly different tone. Um, more or less on the main clouds, uh, you can somehow uh, run 
FreeBSD and that's not a problem. I think the problem is that once you run FreeBSD in very modern, I'm not saying it's a very good direction, but in modern company or corporate um, world, FreeBSD is completely useless even when run on um, on the cloud. I, obviously, uh, completely is a um, is a exaggeration, but I think we need to start working towards um, adopting some standards, um, OCI containers, things like that, that actually count for the companies today, whether we like it or not. Um, I might not be a Docker um, lover. I might be more um, aligned toward um, Kubernetes and ContainerD and whatever else, but we, we have none of these things. So even if you run things on cloud, which I agree, we, we should, this is, I, I haven't touched in my professional work uh, a bare metal server in probably roughly a decade now, really, if I'm being honest. Um, even if we run on, on the cloud and we can't do anything useful for the companies that they are um, today, then that's a tough thing to, tough, uh, tough, um, oh dear, I'm missing the word, tough contest um, to run with against all other operating systems being pretty much Linux. <laughs> so I'll um, go away from the cloud and say that I think the places that we're also going to find people are by making sure we have workable laptops, since we do provide an operating system and workable laptops matter. And I spend a lot of my time on laptops and making sure our stuff works on previously Lenovo, and now I've turned to Dell because Lenovo has forsaken me. Um, and uh, the other one to mention, of course, is the work that we've all been doing in Embedded. Um, I think if people are building new companies now, a lot of what they're building is IoT, which we all know is just networked small computers. And that's a place where FreeBSD can do really well because we have good networking and good support on ARM64, uh, which is where those things are gonna come from, at least for the mid range. Uh, we're unlikely to run in a battery powered PIC processor, but once you get to an ARM based system, we actually are very competitive. Um, I think I will jump on that saying that I think there is also a misunderstanding from a lot of people about what core is about, uh, because I hear a lot of things about, uh, I will move this technically, uh, FreeBSD in this direction or this direction. And I will try to do that, which is something that every single committer can push. And yes, of course, the project as a whole can also help and that where maybe core can help a little bit, but core is not about uh, you know bringing new tools uh, or uh, porting things to whatever platform or to to this or that. It's more about helping the developers, helping the community, enlarging it by um, uh, helping whoever wants to go helping on the on the cloud. For example, uh, they come with the code, and then you you make sure that uh, they have an easy pass into the project so that they can commit things, and then FreeBSD gets better in that area. Um, so. Yeah, for sure, as a member of the core team and as far as I witnessed for the core team, we cannot change any of those things, but we can favor, we can help them, help people to uh, to get in the project. And I think that's uh, the most important, uh, lower the barrier, make sure that they feel welcome, uh, that they have they have proper reviews. We don't just blindly uh, commit pro, uh, things from them. And then uh, we will reach all the niches uh, we are talking about because people will be interested in bringing FreeBSD there. Yeah, and uh, Keith, I, I totally agree with you uh, when you say Core is not really a technical organization. It's all about providing tools and um, frameworks for people to succeed technically, and I, I really agree with that uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I will amend that and say that you know, we're Core, the, the tools the Core has at disposal are its teams, the security team, release engineering team, that kind of stuff, and that's where Core really makes an impact is, is, is helping to guide those teams help set help them set their direction and help them accomplish their goals you know and then on top of that it's being the face of the project and uh you know encouraging people to to join encouraging people to stay and, and encouraging the tools that are needed in order to do all those things um you know when you talk about cloud uh you know there was a time where we were producing cloud images from release engineering but they weren't actually working they weren't actually being tested and that's something where you know core needs to be helping the engineering team uh, kind of up its game there. You know, 
course, doesn't necessarily have to do the work itself to you know, write the scripts and all that kind of stuff or do the testing, but it's the core's job to be checking in like good managers to make sure that, that the stuff that was supposed to be getting done is getting done. Um, and that's where, you know, I, I, when we talk about cloud, when we talk about all these other things, that's where core really contributes is in helping the bigger picture happen, not the smaller details. Yeah, core is a lot of what core does. I'd like to uh, echo and amplify what Scott said. A lot of what core does is to facilitate and to uh, encourage people that uh, um, are in groups where we have some perceived the deficiency in what we're producing. Like you said, with the um, cloud images that didn't even work, we had um, embedded images that didn't even work and encouraged people to put in infrastructure to um, test that more thoroughly. And now our embedded images, at least last time I checked, work. So it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of the job is um, knowing who to talk to, knowing who's working on what, and connecting people. And um, another part of the job is then using your powers of persuasion to convince people to do what you want, because that's the biggest stick you have most of the time. Yeah, and depending on what how that's going, um, core can be a pretty big time sink with regards to doing exactly that, all the kind of like the non-technical behind the scenes, coordination, calls, documentation, et cetera. Um, moving people, if you've ever been a manager or something to that effect, you, you realize it takes effort and takes effort, to, uh, takes time to do well. So if you're productive before, that's the warning. It's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess uh, echoing uh, Sean's comment, if um, if you have great technical ideas um, and you know how to implement them and you're really excited to get them done, um, don't run for core. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Bravo, yeah, like um, I can't, can't I, the number of, of person hours that were consumed by personality conflicts, for instance, um, or other kind of like what would be kind of like perceived as, as bureaucratic, you know, pushing of issues is non-trivial. And um, it can leave you pretty crispy when you actually try and, and approach some of those issues with uh, a level of professionalism or seriousness, because it, it's non-trivial. We like to hold ourselves to a high bar, and uh, nobody lets you off easy. But that's really the point of CORE, is to take on those, those, those tasks that are not necessarily technical, but it's going to be done. I, I can't remember who said it at the beginning, but you know, there's a lot more for you to see than just the technical side. There's the non-technical side, and that's what core is for. And yeah, if you if, if you want to be pushing technical uh, things, then just go do it. You don't need to be on core for that. Core is all about helping people in the less technical ways. And there's also uh, an element on being on core of. Uh managing the health of the project and making sure people are talking to each other that need to be and that when there's friction um, if it's due to misunderstanding or an outdated process or an outdated um, standard in the community or a kind of a, a notion of what the right thing to do is that you advocate for change to help reduce that friction in the community Uh, so the next question uh, was, uh, how do we go about getting, attracting new committers and or turning existing contributors uh, into committers and overall lowering the, the friction to people uh, contributing to FreeBSD? GitHub, in a word. I'll go, okay. Go ahead, Ashan. No, nope, I'm done. That was it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, G GitHub might be, uh, might be an answer. Uh, but I think, first of all, we need to have a clear path for users uh, to so that they know how to submit a patch. Uh, do they send something on a mailing list, uh, some attachment on a mailing list that will be mangled by the, uh, by the mailing list software? Do they do a pull request on GitHub? Do they do a review on Fabricator? Uh, I don't think we are very clear on what do we accept because we accept mostly everything. Uh, I mean, we use Bugzilla as somewhere to put a patch. 
and where I, I don't care even if I care for the sake of the <laughs> question, I don't care what uh, tool we use, but we have to use one tool. Or if it's two, at least it's clear, written somewhere, and we can direct the person, okay, uh, just do that, follow this guideline, uh, do some git format patch, some, something, blah, 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 use uh, uh, Arcanist to use review or whatever, but it has to be written, it has to be clear. And the conf if there is no confusion, at least per some people would be more willing to send their work. Uh, right now, they just don't know how to do it. Okay. I would like to build on that. Sorry. sorry. Um, I, I, would, want to... I wanted to build on it too. The, the idea that we have a great lack in documentation of policies, procedures, and guidelines is kind of my idea of the running platform here. And that we severely confuse the user base in how to proceed in lots of areas. The user base, our committers, the developers, there isn't a clear and consistent set of documented, actually written policies and procedures on how to do a lot of things. It's a lot of it, it's just ad hoc, how it's been done for 25 years or how it's been done for the last five years. It changes stories over time and I think we would be doing ourselves a great deal of service if we documented some of those and made it possible for somebody to pull up a wiki, a handbook. We, the handbook used to be a great thing. It's now seriously deteriorated. So they can just look and go, oh, well, if I go do this, I can get my patch submitted and some developer's going to look at it and it might get fixed instead of shoving it in Bugzilla. Oh, God, I hope it sees the right person. But so the problem with that, like, the, the can, problem can with just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, I've seen many cases where people were confused, where they asked on the mailing lists, they were appointed to Bugzilla, they were appointed to Fabric, they had some other way to contribute. And in not enough cases, these people got their feedback. And this was very annoying for the people involved. So uh, they, they left after a few attempts. And this is what I try to improve because I'd like to get these people to communicate more about this. I would like to build um, on that. I actually strongly agree with everybody um, who spoke uh, before me. Uh, yes, Git. Um, yes, I hate it. Uh, the battle has been lost a long time ago. It's Git. We just need to accept it and move on. Um, yes, we need. Uh, better documentation as to coherent documentation. There is giant split between, between uh, wiki, uh, handbook, and some random articles on the web page, um, which is very troubling. Um, there is split between Bugzilla and Fabricator, uh, neither of which tools I personally love very much, uh, but the split is confusing at, at least to uh, new users. There's one thing I have personally very strong beef with, we need a cultural uh, cultural change in how we actually treat submissions. We do have a lot of submissions. Uh, we have tons of PRs, and we do nothing about them. What I personally spent a lot of my uh, time is doing something trivial. I look for PRs that I can actually yeah, you know, comprehend uh, with my knowledge about ports, and I take the patches, I apply them, I commit them, and I thank the user. And I try to do that in a timely manner because if somebody sends, spends his personal time to go through all of our hoops, all of our outdated tools, learn them, send the patch, and then be told it's not sharp, go back and make this, and they go back and make the diff and send the diff, and then for three months, nobody does anything. They just go away and never come back. Um, I believe the change shift in our culture, how we actually train new mentees, that handling of PRs should be an actual duty and they won't be resolved, uh, sorry, they won't be um, released to run solo until they do their chores in PRs should be actually part of our training, our culture, that we don't ignore users, we don't ignore patches, um, and this is how we uh, introduce new and fresh blood. Yeah. Uh, but one last thing, I think. Uh, sorry, if you mind, Warner? No, go ahead. Um, one of the things that as a project we need to get better about is skating to where the puck is going, not where it is or was in the past. 
which is something that as a project where we have a tendency to go do, we have made the migration to Git after the decision was already made. We were not proactive about that as a community and not forward thinking at all. And um, that's a real problem with the way that kind of the core team had been run in the past. And, and one of the things that the current core team did a really good job of, of um, you know, setting out some goals internally and trying to figure out how to pay down some of the organizational project debt that we had in order to begin um, looking at where we need to go and, and moving forward. So, um, because a lot of this is like, you know, we're talking about tools that had a shelf life that were already creaky 10 years ago when we adopted them. Um, and that's, you know, for better or worse, it means that, that a lot of this work needs to be very forward thinking. Yeah, the projects had a perennial um, problem with um, getting to finished for, for submissions, either a clear rejection or a clear it's going in. And part of the problem has been documentation, but a large part of the problem has just been um, mustering the manpower necessary once a patch is committed. We can document it all, the, all we want, but if we don't have people whose job it is to manage the patches, bust the bugs, whatever, um, then they're going to go somewhere and, oh, somebody has a busy day and they were dealing with it just fine. And then it slips their mind because life happened and there's no oversight or reminder or mechanism to draw people back or to make sure that the issues get to done. And some of that can be technical, but some of it is personnel and some of it is cultural. So I, I, I think. Yeah, I think Warner. Some of, one of our problems also is we we can have a tendency um, to be unwilling to say no. If if we have a patch that comes in that someone's made um, and it's not quite right, um, you know, as a project, we we generally, if it's if it's great, we'll we'll, we'll merge it. Um, if it's you know questionable, it might just languish there for languish there forever. And sometimes we need to just say, you know, thank you for for your submission, but it doesn't actually uh, go in the way we need or something like that. So. Uh, sorry, we won't be accepting it. Well, one thing so, that needs to improve is a culture of when a patch comes in, like building on Ed, is a clear statement of why it is not going, what improvements need to be, instead of just a random, uh, this this doesn't work, you, you need to prove it better, you know, if you can't actually state why it needs to improve and how to improve it, then you need to uh, remove yourself and not object to it. And that's one of the big cultural issues in FreeBSD. Well, actually, I would disagree with that in part because um, I actually go back to what Ed says. We're too nice. And <laughs> when we're too nice, we don't say no, we let the thing languish. We should be willing to say, no, this patch is not good. Uh, you, you did not submit something that we can use. If you wish to try again later, that's fine, um, rather than let them languish. Oh, I clear agree. Because clear communication would be better. And the, the whole idea of people recusing themselves because they can't explain why it's better, there are sometimes when the answer to what would make it better would be remove it because <laughs> it is terrible. And that's, I think, in part what Ed is saying nicely and what I am saying not nicely, which is sometimes we get patches that are just junk and we have to be yeah. willing to say they're junk. Yeah, but if Constantine says it's junk, I'm willing to go with him, and he doesn't need to say anything further unless, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, unless it's something I submitted and I want to make it better. And, you know, maybe he should say it in a different way, but that should, you know, because if he just says it's junk, that's good enough for me to have it be blocking. Now, if it's in the VM, now if it's elsewhere in the kernel, maybe not. But, you know, there are times that... Let me interject here real quick. Um, Okay. We've been talking about how to address PRs ever since I've been involved in the project. <laughs> it's been it, it's been a problem that we just don't seem to be very good about solving. And, and always the answer is we need to try harder. We need to work harder. We need to, you know, tell people to to pay attention to their PRs. We need to, tell, you know, and whether it's say yes, say no, spend more time on it. We've been fighting this for almost 30 years, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And I don't think that trying harder is necessarily the quick fix for it either. Um, you know, if you look around to other projects, you know, using Linux as an example, they actually have a very small committer base, but it's been wildly successful because they've given people the tools to basically go off and, and do their own forks and not feel like they're beholden to a, a, a certain set of people in order to get their work in. And I think Git is one of the tools that uh, will allow us to help do that, where you don't necessarily have to have committer access. You don't necessarily have to have your, your PRB be submitted in order to 
have something to show for it in order to, to be able to to publish a git tree for what you're doing and say you know hey maybe my maybe my work wasn't wasn't accepted but here it is and someone else can use it um i think that goes a long way towards getting people, more people involved and can go a long way towards kind of building up the profile of something that may have been forgotten but once other people start using it then it, then it gets more momentum and, and us as developers can pay more attention to it um but really what it comes down to is I don't think the answer is to work harder at PRs. I think the answer is to give people different tools in order to get their work published and feel like they're contributing and not just having to go into Bugzilla or wherever and maybe it gets, it gets pay attention, maybe they're told no, maybe they're told yes, whatever. I just think, you know, it's, it's time to kind of look at this problem differently and say, you know, we've we tried really hard for 30 years. One, it, one question. Yeah. One question. We had many important projects forking from the FreeBSD base, let's say like OpenSense, Hardened BSD, and other relevant projects. And do you think that Git versus Subversion or whatever was the main issue? The main issue was complex changes weren't allowed into the system, and so folks needed to fork. And this is apparently a problem with getting people involved in a way that it's low barrier of entry type of work. And so I, this is which hurted our user base very much. Because if you look around today, you won't understand why there are so many different versions of the fork doing some important parts, but not going back into the main line. I, I actually think well, forks are great. You know, there isn't just one Linux. There isn't just Red Hat and nothing else. There's, okay. there's hundreds of forks. And they're all doing very well in their own way. I think forks are, are really good. It, you know, you say OpenSense and Hardened BSD. I think those are both great examples. Um, you know, those both had very complex things that had a lot of community disagreement. I think them forking was probably the best thing for them because then those projects could could do things on their own, go to, go go in their direction, and prove things out. And in some cases, you know, the main line kind of passed passed those things by and, and they became irrelevant and that was fine. Those people got their creative outlet and their technical outlet. And some in some cases, you know, you wind up with a Dragonfly or a OpenBSD or whatever where they're doing good work on their own and, and they can get folded back in to FreeBSD um, or another BSD, you know, when when there's motivation to do so. I, but I think I think forking is actually really good and it helps encourage a diverse community instead of a, a monolithic community. I think I agree. I think, go ahead, Justin. I, I agree with you, Scott. I think um, I think our tools need to facilitate and um, encourage forking. We have in Subversion the projects tree, which is pretty much unused now, except in a few cases. Everybody has their own private Git trees elsewhere, and they do their work and eventually push it in but that's more difficult and more time consuming for other people to do they can instead just fork on github do their work but then how does it get back to FreeBSD? go go through bugzilla or go through fabricator go through 30 40 50 rounds of reviews and then it eventually then eventually gets in but that could be a year or more whereas there could be cross-pollination between some fork between a bunch of different forks and FreeBSD as things improve in the various forks. So, so I case. actually, I want to point out briefly that this is not an argument for good forks. This is an argument for good merging, which yeah. comes back to tools and comes back to training and comes back to updating the handbook to explain to people how to well, do it. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing against that, George. I mean, about the know. PR and things like that, I think the main problem is not uh, the PR tree edge, I mean, for sure it will be always a problem. It has always been, and there will be always people sitting on that. It's more um, who to talk to when you have to, to, to push a patch and you don't know anyone in the community. Uh, I mean, I've been uh, bringing a lot of people to the community. I've brought back uh, a company uh, to FreeBSD, used to be, and then didn't. And they all find that it's fairly easy to, uh, to commit into FreeBSD and to get the change into FreeBSD. Why? Because they know me, and then from me, I bridge them to uh, this place and this place. But if you don't know a FreeBSD committer, if you don't know uh, anyone, then your patch will just uh, rot uh, on the on the Bugzilla, 
even even more if it's complicated because no one will just look at it and say hey maybe i don't know uh, water maybe ahead you may want to have a look at that uh, and thing like that and even uh seasoned people in the bsd project i mean i just take recent example uh for the hcpd uh they were just uh, not being able to do anything on free bsd and then they, they they needed to get someone uh to bridge them to uh, the proper people. I've never been doing any work on the capsicumization of the DHCPD, but I just make sure that uh, the author was uh, talking to the right person. And I think that's where we are very bad compared to uh, mm -hmm. many other projects is where to drive people to. On, on Linux, uh, if you look at the kernel, uh, they have the maintainer.pl. Uh, we used to have a maintainer file and it fails because we don't maintain it and it's hard to get it. So I, I don't really know what the what the real answer to that, and we already discussed about that in in uh, uh, the core uh, in the core team when I was in, and we never found the the, the solution. But I really think uh, the solution is somewhere there. How to facilitate the communication and know who to talk to. As soon as you talk to the right person, maintaining the right subsystem, the right ports, or the right uh, tool, then uh, everything goes very fast. Each time I've witnessed something like that in the in the project. Yeah, what, what I've heard a couple of people, sorry, uh, if I may, just a quick throw in. Um, uh, I've heard a couple of people mention that our documentation um, has um, slipped in the quality that it, we were famous, uh, famously known for. George mentioned um, training, tooling, and documentation in one sentence. Funny enough, um, one of the reasons why our documentation is in a state uh, uh, it is in is that our tools for documentations are horrible. In past, I think I tried twice, maybe three times. It was just pain, 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 and more pain. And the docs team has been doing tremendous work trying to take that pain on them, but that doesn't just scale and just doesn't work. And I think tooling gets more and more important, not only around SRC, not only around ports, testing automation, also around uh, documentation. What I don't know how documentation looks uh, like now, just because a couple of years ago I tried, it was so painful. I don't want to even think about going back to it. So let me jump on this one actually, because this is a current thing actually that was not publicized widely, but has been um, a success. The There's a translation working group team that is actually working to and has mobilized Zenata. If you jump into Slack, um, speaking of modern tooling, you jump into Slack, there's a Zenata Slack channel there um, that's talking about um, and has been talking about the numbers and adoption there of users um, and new translations that have been refreshed explicitly because of the tooling. Um, and so one of the things that I think and I expect will likely happen is there's going to be a pretty serious conversation about DocBook and its future relative to other modern markup languages, which I don't think are as good, but that like the argument's already been settled. Um, uh, in the form of ASCII doc or Markdown or some of the other more um, contributor friendly um, formats. So yeah, there's some neat work there. Um, uh, give me a second, uh, somebody else could talk, but give me a second, I'll come back and, and highlight some of that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's WG doc 19 is the name of the Slack channel. I just, I just wanted to, to say that sometimes large patches don't get into the tree because they suck. Uh, it's the elephant in the room here. Hardened BSD is not in the tree, not because we don't like it, or not because we don't like people or something. It's just not, it's a large patch that changes a lot of things. A lot of the stuff is dubious. Some of it's really good. One of the things other projects are very good about is insisting small individual changes. If you were to submit the diffs between us and Harden BSD, a diff that size in Linux, they would say, please make this smaller. We never do that. We just kind of passive aggressively shuffle our feet and go, you know, whatever, which is, also, not a functional way to deal with new com new committers um, and give them an answer. This is too big. Break it up, you know. And hey, if we're picky and it take, you know, there was a time when we had a reputation for being too picky, so we stopped. But that was a big disservice because the problem wasn't we were too picky at the time. The problem was we never could get to done, and that's still the problem today. We never get we don't get to done and ensure everything goes in. So Many communities are more picky than we are, and way more picky, are and way more complicated tools, and they are very popular. Look at the Linux kernel. It's very picky. It's very popular. They have a lot of people. They don't use GitHub, pull requests, whatever, and it goes to complicated tools. 
but they have it documented. It's straightforward to go through. And as soon as you're not following the road that they have designed, then they just tell you, come back with anything that respect, yeah. and they point to at the right documentation. And they are very um, unpleasant to deal with because they just tell you, this is where the documentation is. I won't read your patch as soon as you haven't followed that. But that doesn't prevent them to get a lot of new contributors. I'm not saying we should follow the same path as being rude, but we, the tooling we have might be complicated. The problem is not that. The problem is we have to find a way through those tools and what is the proper way to submit anything. We have several tools. Something like that. We have several tools. And the this is, is making it confusing. Yes. But the Baxilla uh, fabric and probably others. Yes. Can, I, can I point out? Can I point out that this problem will also not be solved by Core? The problem will only be solved by Core asking the hats to solve it. Thank you, George. But it, can you, it, can it you tell me? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me what hats you mean? Well, you have a doc hat. You have a ports hat. Um, clearly, the documentation issue would be taken to the docs hat. So I think that's the level. Hmm, that's a complicated um, pithy statement to respond to. Sorry. Um, yeah, that um, in the case of release engineering, that's something that, that core ended up having to take on its plate with regards to release schedules. Um, and so that's something that, that ended up on our desk. Um, there was a COC team that ended up on core's desk. There is. Um, you know, tooling was something that started out on Core's desk, and then we created a working group because we explicitly needed to go and charter this. It's not something that we can push off. We've tried that, and it doesn't work very well. Yeah, I'm not saying core, you push it off. I'm just pointing out that Core doesn't solve those problems. Core, core manages ways to get solved problems. Correct. Right. Correct. But core also has to manage the teams. They can't say, "Oh, this is a doc problem." Right. Sure. End of discussion and walk away. They have to say, right. "Back in a month, what have you done in the last month to make this better?" And come back next yeah. month. Okay, that's, that's great. What have you done to make it better and, and, and bird dog it? And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of time yeah. um, to, to, to do. So but it, there's, a lot, they, there's a lot hiding behind George's, oh, the hats just do it. We make the hats do it, or we have right. to create hats. But, but believing, that, be, believing that getting on core with a technical statement is going to solve a problem for the project means that you don't quite understand how core works. So Correct. I'm trying to gently explain how core works, which is, Core, core waves flags, core manages other groups, core talks to the hats, and core cajoles, begs, pleads, yep. yells, beats people with sticks, and hopefully till we get it done. And that's I what I think me, Can you tell me, can you tell me oh. for the two groups I'm working in, in the post mother group and the fabric group, who's the fucking head of these groups? I don't know, and I'm working in them for a few years. Well, uh, Postmaster, I think it's you by default now. <laughs> <laughs> no. Congratulations. You touched it, you broke it. <laughs> Congratulations on your promotion. To, to comment on George, but, um, but, George's but, sentence, I, I don't know about others, uh, but I myself don't um, live with the illusion that, you know, uh, me going on core is going to magically make all those things happen. But I would have hoped that um, the core could perhaps um, start being a little bit more inspirational, maybe a little bit more forward looking, uh, maybe have a little more initiative towards proposing projects that could be funded uh, through the foundation uh, and finding developers simply willing to pick up the work, even if they're not personally very interested in, in that. If there is uh, simply enough, if there is money to be paid for that particular um, Feature, perhaps we could uh, inspire the project and people to pick up uh, where they otherwise wouldn't just because they have to pay their bills in, in other ways. So more inspirational, more envisioning, and I don't have any, uh, any, any illusions around uh, just by sheer will, of course, things will happen. So this is actually a fun so, one. Um, more, oh, sorry to jump in on this real quick. We actually just had a meeting with the foundation where the core team was basically outlining exactly that and saying, like, listen, we need to figure out a better process for some of this stuff because you're you're spot on in some of that, Bartek. I'll let some of the other core people or somebody from the foundation go, but yeah. go ahead, Scott. Sorry. Uh, uh, 
that said, I mean, you don't need to be on core in order to get up at a conference and encourage people to work on things. You really, really don't. In fact, a lot of people have been very effective doing that and have never been on core or were on core at the time. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I, I lost what I was going to say. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Um, oh, and one more thing is, is just that um, I, I don't want this to devolve into calling out bad code and bad people. Um, I tried to stay away from that when I was saying, when I was talking about things earlier, I'd like people to continue to stay away from that. Well, part of this is that there's no real binary division between technical and cultural problems within the project, right? We've already said, or we've enumerated a bunch of different obstacles to contributors. We don't have any kind of automated style checking. We don't have any well-defined workflow for submitting patches. There's no way to find the maintainer of a particular piece of code and so on and so on. Um, and I think not having been on core, I think part of core's responsibility is just to at least try and prioritize and at least recognize the, the, the kinds of issues so that I can um, you know, establish what, what's the most important thing to solve. Obviously, we're not going to make contributing to FreeBSD a frictionless process. But what are the what, what's the most important thing? What what steps can it do to, to actually resolve it? I mean, you know, I don't think Core should be responsible for writing a style checker, but that's that's something that people have complained about for as long as they've been involved in FreeBSD, and nothing has really happened towards it. So what what can Core do in that case? So style checker thing comes up a lot. Once again, it's been coming up for decades now, and it always seems like we get stuck on style nine as the bible versus a I may I may style checker that that uh, can actually check it, and it seems like people always conclude that style nine has internal inconsistencies that make it impossible to write a style checker for it. Um, you know, is that something that we should address one way or another? Um, I mean, Bruce did have his lint script that came pretty close to style nine. I'm not sure whatever came of that. So. What would be a problem in agreeing as a project for a set of exceptions that would make such style checker um, possible um, to write? I mean, Python, that my, my background language, is famous for um, enforcing some style uh, rules, like you know, very short um, code lines that are broadly by a community. Um, considered to be, you know, you just disable that because it's unworkable, even though it's very official. Um, everybody just extends uh, past 80 characters per line and, and just live with it. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess I ask that question just to kind of see, you know, that's one of those non-technical, non-personal things that is hard for the project to do is, you know, style. And, you know, are we ready to, to take on the, 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 the public discussion and, and disagreement, that kind of stuff over something that's really non technical. It doesn't really actually impact how code runs, but yet is being identified, you know, has been identified for decades as something that people care about. Um, so, my point being is that probably having, uh, I think that having a coherent, sorry, coherent style for a project is probably. Um, more useful than not having anything there. That, that there then could be a tool where we could point a user at and ask, please confirm. You know, whatever you put in has to get out with a green tick mark or whatever checkbox. And you know, that that's one of the steps to get your patch um, accepted without any friction, as opposed to okay, if I review that, I will insist on you. Com, com, uh, you know, committing to that style. If if somebody else reviews that, he will ask you to do something else than I told you, which is extremely confusing. For this automated tool that does that, you know, has exceptions broadly accepted. Obviously, we won't find any situation that satisfies all of us. As long as it, there is a standard that we said it's our standard. It's I don't know, style nine version free BSD, and that's it. Um, and here's the tool, and it checks your code. As long as it says you're good, then you're good. All right, what else, Alan? Anything else um, coming in? 
I need to drop off here relatively yeah, soon. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've uh, used up our hour, so it might make sense to wrap up. But if anybody has any closing thoughts, we can do that. We need to find a way to shorten the core team agenda as a closing thought. Just the whole project needs to think about that. The core team is being sanctioned to do way, way too much. Actually, one of the last things that we were talking about doing in this current core team, um, I think it was Baldwin took that up, was um, to go and pare down um, and Warner and a few other few like we want to go and aggressively prune what's on our agenda and just say like closed won't fix effectively because like we just don't have the bandwidth to go do that. And if it comes up as a priority, re -add it. But like one of the things that we did at the start of this core term was we went through and, and basically said, we're not going to deal with a bunch of this and, and close like 70% of the issues or something like that. And then focused on a couple to have some wins. I don't know if the length of the agenda is necessarily a, a problem. Although, you know, at times it's getting long. The, the bigger problem is just making sure that we follow through and get stuff done and uh, over time, because it's very easy to start on a problem and then just let it linger and go away. Um, so it's not so much the length, but the follow through that I think is important on that. Because oversight takes time and is a pain in the <clears throat> keister. But would it help if we delegate uh, tasks and just do the oversight? That's what we do already. If you find the right yeah. people, it's great. If you find the wrong people, you're spending three times as much time hassling them as it would be just to blankety blank do it yourself. And one of the things that's been an interesting thing to observe is the number of people that have kind of like um, homesteaded individual areas of the project and said, well, the core has never bothered me about this before. So because no prior core team has bothered me about this, I'm just going to kind of basically disregard what core has to say. And we've run into that particular sentiment a few times in this particular term itself. And that's been an interesting thing to observe as well, um, where really like different constituents in the community are not used to, you know, having core reach out and ask and say, hey, what's going on with this? Um, and that's led to some uh, complicated interactions for us to kind of navigate as well, because you know, at the end of the day, like status quo doesn't necessarily work. Like the only thing that's constant is change, right? And you need to keep up with it or, you know, perish or die. And, and I'll, I dropped a note into a, an IRC channel of a, a, an interesting um, picture where there was a sun server that was cut in half and being used as a taco truck. Like there's lots of great reminders about why we, we have to continue to evolve because perfect is the enemy of good, and unfortunately, and we need to make forward progress. Um, otherwise, you know, we basically become irrelevant as a project and we're not there yet. We do a lot of good work as a community, but we need to keep it up. Well, the, go, go, going on that, the one thing I don't want to see happen in FreeBSD or facilitated by anybody is the whole Silicon Valley mantra, move fast and break things. One thing I really like about FreeBSD from a technical and from a technical standpoint and a user standpoint is it's really easy, it's really straightforward, and it's pretty damn solid. Yeah, and okay, um, so I've I've experienced the other, a few ends of this. I've um, I've also experienced system develop that that happens at a glacial pace that. Is, does not keep up with modern, hard, modern hardware or modern problems. Um, and so there is a balance to be had there. And, and like, I come back to the statement, perfect is the enemy of good. And, but I do think that you're right and that we do have a good balance for a lot of things uh, with regards to stability. But um, I do think there's other areas of the project where we can maybe be, or not can, we should be more aggressive and we just haven't been yet. Yes, just don't, don't, don't break things for the sake of progress for, in the name of progress is in the name of progress. Make changes, break things to make them better. I think it's pretty easy to agree to. Anyone else have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Um, my closing thought would be that it was extremely um, enjoyable and interesting discussion, um, even for myself. Um, I hope for people who are viewing us or listening to us as well. 
Um, it was great to actually see and hear um, some of you personally. Um, and despite your best attempts, I will still try and run for core. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think the database is locked, so it's not possible to back out at this point either. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone for uh, coming and everyone who asked questions, even if we didn't necessarily get to all of them. And uh, feel free to keep chatting in the chat room and so on. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Thanks for making me Cheers. run again.